The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall, concierge of this halfway hotel, located somewhere between reality and illusion, and convenient to both. We speak of reality and illusion as if they are two separate and distinct states. But are they? Can one exist without the other? Aren't they like pain and pleasure, love and hate, life and death? Two opposites, inseparably linked together, like the two sides of the same coin? Yes, and so close are they that it's hard to tell where one begins and the other ends. Major Morrissey, you realize you are disobeying a written order of General Wallace. I realize that, Lieutenant. But General Wallace won't care. He'll be dead. What? You'll be dead, too. Major, have you taken leave of your mind? Tomorrow, there will be battle. There can't be. The enemy isn't within miles. In eight hours, we will all be dead. We will die bravely. Major, are are you saying you can see into the future? that's, That's impossible. Nobody can see into the future. I can, Lieutenant. I've been there. Our mystery drama, The Other Self, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Howard Da Silva. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The belt is about uh, two feet wide and, uh, oh, a hundred feet long. It moves slowly, and uh, carried on it is a row of uh, things. Well, they start off as single things, smallish, tubular, plastic things. But all along the hundred feet of slowly moving belt, there stand men and women. And each, in turn, adds something, or does something, then waits about four seconds, and then a fresh new thing comes by on the belt. Take Oliver Townsend, that tall blonde fellow, about two-thirds of the way down the line. Well, every four seconds, here's what he does. He picks up a thing, gives the rotating end of it a turn, taps it with his finger, fuses it with one touch of a special heat gun, sends it on its way, and picks up the next. And he does it to a kind of rhythm. He says, turn, tap, zap And he does this every day for eight hours. How does he keep from going mad? Maybe he doesn't. Turn, tap, zap. Turn, tap, zap. Turn, tap, zap. I don't know what else I can tell you, Dr. Hagman. Oh, excuse me. Yeah? Well, how do we stand today, Miller? No, that much, huh? Well, the overall percentage for the month is not going to be too good. Yeah, all right. We were just talking about this, Dr. Hackman. Absenteeism on the first shift is 20%. That means one in five workers did not show up. And this is your usual pattern, Mr. Wallace? It is getting to be our usual pattern. These are all production line workers? That's where we hurt. Mm. Well, if it's any consolation, most production line workers have the same problem. No, that doesn't help me. Orders are piling up. I can't fill them. Why don't your employees show up? Why? They call in sick, mostly. Are they sick? I guess they are. They're sick of working. You must admit, these are dull, monotonous jobs. So, what can I do about that? 
Try to make the job exciting. Exciting? Well, interesting. Interesting? Oh, good Lord. You could, for example, vary the rhythm of the production line. Have the place painted in more interesting colors. Dr. The Hackman, line itself, you... alternated with the components, could be things like uh, pictures, little puzzles, slogans. Yeah, but my people have to watch what they're doing. They have to concentrate. Even music is out. Then eliminate the jobs. Can't a machine be devised that would... No, no, because those components have to be finger-tightened. You can't get a machine that can feel it or sense it. Still, there must be people who actually thrive in this kind of work situation. I never found any. Is there anybody here who loves his work? <laughs> I never heard anybody say they loved the production line. Well, they don't have to say it. There can be other testimony. Well, like what? Like a good record of attendance? Let's study the characteristics of those people. Hey, wait a minute. There is one guy. The foreman was talking about him just the other day. He's been working for me eight years. Eight years. And in all that time, he hasn't even been absent once. Well, then, a clinical study is definitely in order. His name is Oliver Townsend. <laughs> Turn, zap, zap. Turn, zap, zap. Turn, zap. Ah, coffee break. Mr. Oliver Townsend? Ah, uh, yeah, that's me. Well, my name is, uh, Wilma Hickman. May I talk with you? For well, sure. Why? Well, I'm, um, I'm a psychologist. No kidding. I think that's great. Why do you think it's great? Why do you think my being a psychologist is great? Because it's better than not being a psychologist. I'm afraid I don't understand. It's so simple. Look, why are you a psychologist? Because that's always been my ambition. Right. So wouldn't it be terrible if you didn't become a psychologist? I, uh, I see. You think I'm crazy. Oh, no, no. Oh, don't let it bother you. Everybody thinks I'm crazy. What do you think? Well, Fifty million Frenchmen can't be wrong. What does that mean? Our doughboys used to say that during World War I. Oh. You notice I call them doughboys. Each war has a different nickname for the American soldier. Really? Yeah. The British are always called Tommies. Tommy Atkins, that is. But we keep changing. In World War II, our boys were called G.I. Joe. Civil War... It was Johnny Reb and Billy Yank. Are you um, interested in wars? Yeah. My war is the Civil War. Is it? I could drive you nuts. Well, actually, people around here give me a nickname. Shiloh. Shiloh? Didn't you ever hear of the Battle of Shiloh? It was also called Pittsburgh Landing. Oh, oh yes. I, I think I remember. You think you remember? Well, I'm... I'm... <laughs> I sort of made the Battle of Shiloh my my life's work. Yeah, you could say that. Why? Why not? Some people play golf, others bowl, hunt, fish. I, I've got the Battle of Shiloh. <laughs> do you work here? Well, I do for a while. Would you like to see the Battle of Shiloh? Uh, where? Over at my place. The reason I asked is you seem interested. I mean, well, most folks think I'm a nut. Oh. Harmless, but a nut. A lot of interesting people were at the Battle of Shiloh. Yes, I'm sure. The Confederates lost the best general they had next to Robert E. Lee, General Albert Sidney Johnson. They also had Beauregard and Braxton Bragg. Is that so? You're not really interested. Oh, I am. I, I am. Of course, you had Grant commanding the Federals and General Lew Wallace. You heard of Lew Wallace. When he came home from the war, he wrote Ben-Hur. There was another General Wallace, too. Bill Wallace. Really? For some reason, I feel very close to him and to that whole Indiana Corps. Mr. Townsend, about your job. We, I mean, they turn the tide at Shiloh. Do you like the work you do? Especially an outfit that was attached to them. Morrissey's Rifles. Uh, do you prefer it to other kinds of they work? They called it a brigade, but it was just an oversized company. 
Tell me, what aspects of the job make it desirable? Well, I've got all these soldiers, you see, made out of lead and tin. And everything's authentic. I mean, the uniforms and all. Is it a question of being happy with your work? I got everything and everybody lined up just the way they were that April morning in 1862. You have to see it. The line's starting up. I, I better get with this. Excuse me. Turn. Tap. Tap. Did you really mean it? Turn. Tap. Tap. When you asked me to see the Battle of Shiloh? Turn. Tap. Tap. Sure. When? Uh, how about tonight? Fine. Turn. Tap. Tap. Oliver. Even Aunt Clara, may I introduce... Oliver, when you said you were bringing someone home to supper, I didn't assume it would be a, a lady friend. Aunt Clara, this is... Oh, my, she's pretty. This is Dr. Heckman, my Aunt Clara. Uh, doctor. Oliver, did you bring a doctor to see me? Now there isn't a thing wrong no, with Dr. me. Dr. Heckman is going to see the Battle of Shiloh. Oh, I might have known. Oh, uh, please, uh, uh, come in. Thank you. Now, Aunt Clara, will you entertain the doctor while I get my men set up? Uh, it'll only take a couple of minutes. Well, won't you sit down, doctor? Oh, please, call me Wilma. What's a pretty girl like you doing being a doctor? Well, I, I'm, I'm really a doctor of philosophy. Well, that's even worse. When I saw you standing in the doorway, I said, Oh, my, maybe now he found himself a girl and he'll come back to this life. This life? As distinguished from which life? Well, the crazy one he's leading now. Oh, you mean at the factory? No. I mean at the Battle of Shiloh. I don't understand. Oh, he's back there, all right. His mind, his heart. There are times when I even think... No, tell me. No? You'll think I'm crazy. There are times when you even think... Well, I, I, I even think his body is back there. Well, that, that's... Uh, you see? You're trying not to say it. You're trying not to say that's crazy. Well, tell me why you think so. Well, I don't have to tell you. Look at him when he talks. Listen to what he says. You'll believe it yourself. Well, everything's ready. Now, how much time do we have before dinner? Well, how long's the battle gonna last? Oh, just a couple of minutes. Well, in that case, fire away. Now, you see why I need the whole basement? Well, it's... It, it, it's... I don't know what to say. It's unbelievable. You have to realize it's nowhere near the real thing. These tables, end to end, they occupy the whole floor. And the soldiers... Soldiers, there must be thousands. It looks like a lot, but you have to remember there were over 80,000 men involved. And I don't have anywhere near that. All these pictures on the walls. Ah, oh, I recognize General Grant. Oh, and wait, that general standing high above the battle of the table, he's also General Grant, right? Uh, how did you get that little statue to look like General Grant? I don't know. I just bought a little statue of a horseman dressed like a Union Army general. And after a while... It began to look like... like Grant. What are you telling me? The truth. And look at the other officers. Now compare them with their pictures on the wall. That's Beauregard. And that's Buell. And Bragg. And Johnson. And Wallace. That's fantastic. Uh, how did you get these made up? I keep telling you. I just bought tin soldiers in Civil War uniforms. And after a while... Wait a minute. This one. This one here. Who's that? Oh, that's Major Morrissey, commanding officer of Morrissey's rifles. But that's uncanny. What's uncanny? This tin soldier. His face. It looks exactly like you. All right. You never know where these things go, do you? Now, here we have a nice, rather conservative lady psychologist trying to solve one of the most searing problems of our highly technical age, boredom. And if she's not careful, 
She's going to find herself dodging bullets at the Battle of Shiloh, which took place more than a century ago. Well, dig in. I'll return in a few moments with Act Two. You've heard it said uh, of certain people in certain parts of our country that they're still fighting the Civil War. Well, you'd be surprised at how many people are still fighting the Civil War, reliving it, restaging it, rethinking it. And why not? It was a war that burned deep into our national consciousness, a war we can't forget, a thoroughly, completely, uniquely American war, a complex war, a deep, brooding, and mysterious war. And like all wars, it brought out the best in us and the worst in us. This tin soldier, the one who's supposed to be Major Morrissey, he looks exactly like you. <laughs> it's your imagination. But anyone who can see would have to admit no, that... probably, but it's a coincidence. Now, I promised you the battle. It is dawn, Sunday morning, April the 5th. The Confederates under General Hardy move against General Prentice's division. I made up a special soundtrack on a tape. Fighting is general and spreads all along the line. Now the gunboats come down the river. And, and here is where Morrissey's rifles make such an important... Wait. wait. What is it? Well, cease firing. Was something wrong? Something? Something's terribly wrong. What? Morrissey's rifles, look at them. What about them? In position near the riverbank. See how I placed them? Well, isn't isn't that what they're supposed to be doing? What happened to their rifles? To their what? Rifles. Well, each one of them seems to have a rifle. Those aren't the rifles we uh, they carried into the Battle of Shiloh. I'm afraid I don't understand. Something something went wrong. And Clara, and Clara, come in here. Well, now what's all this hollering about? And Clara, who's been in this room while I've been gone? Nobody. Now, don't say that. Nobody ever comes into this room. Somebody's been in here. Now, that's impossible. I can prove it. These soldiers, see? What am I supposed to see? These soldiers, they represent Morrissey's rifles. Oh, none of that means a thing to me. Somebody took away their rifles. Oh, now, who'd want to do a thing like that? And Clara, has anybody... No. And I'm no expert, but even I can tell they still have their rifles. Oliver... Why do you say they don't have their rifles? Look at the rifles they're carrying. These were the 58 caliber U.S. Model 1861s. So? But Morrissey's men were armed with Spencers. Oh, but these are just tin soldiers. They are not tin soldiers. All right, they're lead soldiers. They didn't go into combat with the guns they're carrying now, because if they had, the Union forces would have lost the Battle of Shiloh. You know, dinner's just about ready. Let me explain something to you. It was the Spencer repeating rifles that turned the tide, finally. Well, I have no reason to doubt that. See, these 1861s, you see, it's unbelievable how difficult they were to use. That's why I promised my men Spencers. The 1861s took a paper cartridge. You would tear the powder end open with your teeth, empty the powder down the barrel, ram the bullet down on top of it. You, you follow this? You're holding me the way a snake hypnotizes a bird. You pull the hammer halfway back... Adjust your percussion cap, and then, finally, you're ready to fire. Do you realize that was the gun most men used on both sides? Really? Yes, but certain commanders were able to buy their men better weapons. I, that is, Morrissey, bought Spencer's for the whole company. If you'll excuse me, I, I don't understand. We have just started the Battle of Shiloh, and Morrissey's men, who saved the day with their rapid-firing Spencer's, are going into combat with the old muskets that can hardly get off two shots a minute. Well, the, the Battle of Shiloh has been over for many years, so does it really matter what these toy soldiers carry? Yes, it matters. The truth always matters. Now, what happened to the Spencers? These men were carrying Spencers. Uh, why don't we have dinner? And then maybe, like Bo Peep sheep, they'll come home again. Yeah. 
She's a nice girl, Oliver. Are you sure nobody came in here? Well, the least you could have done... She's a little bit too intelligent for you. But you need someone with brains. I wish it would be me, Sarah. Then maybe you take that production line job and go back to being an architect, which is what you studied for. There are enough ugly buildings in this world without my adding any. I won't say another word. Play with the soldiers, if that's all you want out of life. Good night, Aunt Clara. Yeah. Well, good night. What could have happened to those rifles? What could have happened? Have you discovered anything, Dr. Heckman? Yes, Mr. Wallace, in a general way. I've discovered... Wallace. Now, why does your name seem so familiar? I can't imagine. Uh, what have you discovered? The ideal type for this job is someone with a disassociative personality. What does that mean? Just what you think it might. You need people who live in two worlds. Uh, how can anybody live in two worlds? Your face. Where have I seen your face before? Uh, about those people who live in two worlds. Oh, uh, <clears throat> well, most of us do it to a degree. Even you. Me? But don't you ever daydream? Oh, I'm far too busy. You mean you have no secret place where you can be somebody else? Well, uh, admit I... it. Do uh, do you have one? We all have our two places: the open one in the world, and the secret one that exists within ourselves. Which is more important to you, the life you lead in secret, or the one everyone knows about? Don't answer that too quickly. Well, imagination's all very well, but reality is... Fine. Then the people you need are the ones for whom the secret place is more important. Men like Oliver Townsend. Hire people like Oliver Townsend. Oh, excuse me. Yeah? Wallace, I've heard that name and I've seen that face. What do you mean? Okay. All right, I'll talk to you later. Well... Thank you very much, Dr. Heckman. Actually, I haven't even started. If you can't straighten this out, you may be finished. What are you saying? I am saying we got a guy working here named Oliver Townsend. He hasn't missed a day's work in eight years. So you talk to him, and this morning, for the first time, he's absent. But that's... Uh... Things are bad enough, but... Mr. Wallace... I'm sure there's a reasonable explanation. Well, if there is, you had better come up with it. What could have what could have happened to those rifles? What happened? What happened? Oliver? Oliver! Uh, oh. Oh. I guess I must have dozed off. You've been down here all night? All night? Well, it's seven o'clock in the morning. I must have fallen asleep. Well, you'd better think about getting ready for work. Work? I'll have breakfast right away. No, work. Uh, I can't go this morning. What? Oliver, you realize it's the first time in how many years? Call in for me, Aunt Clara. Say I'm sick. Well, I hate to lie, you know. Is there something the matter with you, Oliver? I... I've got a problem. The rifles. I'm having a problem with the rifles. Yeah. Uh, well, I I'll call in and say you're sick. What could have happened? Oh! Whoa there. Who goes there? Major Morrissey. Major? We've been waiting for you to come back. What's wrong? They want to take our Spencer rifles away from us. What are you saying? We're to trade our Spencer rifles for these standard U.S. 1861. Who says so? Direct order from General Wallace. There's a lieutenant from his headquarters waiting on you in your tent.
You can't have my rifles, Lieutenant. Sir, I have the order here from General Wallace. Those weapons are the personal property? No, no, sir. When your unit was mustered into the service, your equipment became the property of the United States Army. And headquarters feels that this particular equipment can be used more effectively elsewhere. What's today's date? Uh... It's Saturday, April the 5th. That's right. Tomorrow is Sunday, April the 6th. Yeah, I would venture to say so, sir. Now, if you would sign the receipt... No, I'm afraid I can't sign that receipt. But, Major, you must sign. Corporal. Yes, sir? Assemble a squad. Unload our expenses from this officer's wagon. But Major Morrissey, that is insubordination. I have a written order. Not anymore. Corporal, in the name of General William Wallace, I order you not you to... You heard un- what I said, Corporal. Now get moving. Ah, uh, yes, sir. Major, surely you don't think you can get away with this. I think I can. And the General will be down here himself the first thing tomorrow morning. No, he won't. Well, how can you say that? Because by tomorrow morning, the Battle of Shiloh will have begun. The Battle of Shiloh? What, what, what's that? There's a little church, a little country church, a couple of miles south of here. And the folks call it Shiloh. And that'll be the center of the fighting when the rebels attack. Major, there isn't going to be a battle tomorrow. The rebels won't attack. They're waiting for us to attack. Now, sir, so far, no harm has been done, and General Wallace needs those rifles. Now, if... In exactly eight hours from now, General Wallace isn't going to need anything. He needs to distribute those spences among the sharpshooter platoons. It's important to him. Eight hours from now, nothing is going to be important to General Wallace. Major, what are you saying? What's your name, Lieutenant? But... <laughs> Butterfield, but but what, what are you... Butterfield. Do you have a wife, Lieutenant Butterfield? Or a girl? Major, will you listen to reason? Go back to your tent, Lieutenant. Write a letter to your wife or your girl. If there's something you felt you never really told her, tell her now. Oliver? Oh. Oh, hello. Here, let me turn it off. Don't, uh, don't let me interrupt anything. No, I'd like you to see the whole thing from the beginning. i just gone to the point where General Wallace is killed. Oh. Yeah, you see, he was... Wallace. William H. Wallace. That's where I heard the name before. I got his picture on the wall, see? Up there. Oliver. General Wallace, look at him. Who does he remind you of? I don't know. Well, the resemblance... The resemblance is uncanny. I still don't know. The face is the same and the name is the same. That could be a picture of your boss... Mr. Wallace? I- I've never seen such a likeness. I-, I never noticed it before. Oh, yes, you have, Oliver. You have. People from the past keep intertwining with people from the present. When Oliver Townsend combines himself with Major Morrissey, We may very well suspect that this might be going on in his own head. But we have a Brigadier General William H. Wallace and an industrialist named William H. Wallace, and both of them look alike. And that isn't confined to Oliver's head. That's a fact. There will be more facts for you to ponder when I return with Act Three. What do we know so far? We know that there are many disassociative personalities. In other words, people who live in two worlds. The first is a world they share, more or less, with everybody. And the second is a world that is all their very own. And things go along very well for a while, but sooner or later, the worlds start to get mixed up. Oliver, this picture of General Wallace, where did you get it? I have a great big album. It has photographs of all the Civil War generals. They're all authentic, and I cut them out of the book and put them on the walls. Mm Mm-hmm. There are two worlds. You live in two worlds. What are you saying? You know what I'm saying. 
In one world, you're Oliver Townsend, a production line worker. In the other, you're Major Morrissey, commander of a Civil War rifle unit. I would You d- won't admit it, but you keep giving it away. You keep seeing yourself as Morrissey. Now, that's true, isn't it? Well, I... But now... Now there's another person who seems to be common to both worlds. Wallace. In this world, he's Oliver Townsend's employer. What was General Wallace to Major Morrissey in that other world? General Wallace? He was Morrissey's superior officer. And what was the relationship between Wallace and Morrissey? They... They had very little to do with each other. Very little or nothing at all? Well, it was Wallace who took away the Spencers from Morrissey just before Shiloh. Wallace took away the Spencers, yes. Oliver, tell me, why did you become interested in the Civil War? I don't know. It just happened. How long ago? I... I was always interested, I guess. What do you mean by always? I may have been born interested. Nobody is born with an interest in anything. These things are created by... By what? By opportunity, personality, experience. No, no. A fellow becomes a nut on golf or stamps. But but a nut the way I'm supposed to be, a nut on Shiloh. No, you got to be born with it. Do you mean to say you were interested in the Civil War since the day you were born? Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's what I mean. But how would you know? Well, suddenly it seems a guy goes overboard about certain things. But the interest was always there. He may not have been aware of it. And then one day, it just... How long have you been studying the Battle of Shiloh? A while, I guess. And what other battles have you analyzed? Huh? None. Why? Well, it's just Shiloh is so interesting. And why are you so concerned with Morrissey's rifles? I don't know. And after Shiloh... Where did Morrissey's rifles go? Where? Well, they must have fought their way farther south. I never thought about it. What are you trying to say? I don't know yet. I don't know. Turn, tap, tap. Turn, tap, tap. Turn, tap, tap. Have a cup of coffee? Oh, oh, thanks. I haven't seen you around lately. Turn, tap, zap. Turn, tap, zap. Eight hours a day. That's how it goes. Eight hours a day. Why do you do it? I need it. Why do you need it? I have to make a living. I need a job. Why do you need this job? It's the only one I can get. Why aren't you designing things, like buildings? Ah. Uh, say, where have you been? Where have you been? I asked you first. In Washington. On a job? It was related to a job. So now, where have you been? Here? Where else? Part of the time. And the rest of the time? All around. Around Shiloh? You know, I learned something from you. Really? Yeah, to keep my mouth shut. I'm not aware that I taught you. Yeah, you talk about those two worlds. Mm -hmm. The private one should be just that. Private. My trouble was I let everyone know about it. Well, do you want to know what I was doing in Washington? I was looking up the records of the Department of the Ohio. The Union Army Corps that fought at Shiloh. What? I was looking for Morrissey's rifles. Well, you could have asked me. They were attached to the 9th Indiana. I know. And later, all records of them were lost. Why? It was a long time ago. And not all the records survived. Is that the reason? Well, sure. Look, do you suppose I could see you afterwards? I have to get back to work in another minute. Mm Mm-hmm. Turn, tap, zap. How can you do that all day? I don't mind it. I suppose you do need it. That's what I told you. I need it to support myself. No. You need it to support your other world. 
Well, now, Dr. Hickman, that's uh, going back a long time. Yes, I realize that, Mr. Spencer. It must be all of uh, nine years. We've had a lot of young architects come and go through this office. Uh, Oliver Townsend. Um... You don't remember him? Uh, yes, I remember him, I, I think. I, I could have personnel look it up. Oh, thank you, but, but what I really need is your own human reaction to him. As I recall, he didn't last long, maybe uh, six months. Did you fire him? No, no, he quit. Why? Well, uh... Oh, now I remember. He, he, he just walked into my office one day and said, uh, I don't think I want to be an architect. Did he give you any reason? Well, I asked him. I said, son, now don't you like architecture? And he said, I like it, but it takes up too much of my time and energy. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you, Mr. Spencer. Oh, you're quite welcome, Doctor. Spencer. Spencer. Odd that your name should be Spencer. Well, why is it odd? That was my father's name. <laughs> well, there was... There was, there still may be, a rifle called the Spencer. And it must have been named after its inventor. Are you related? Oh, I, I think so, distantly. Uh, why do you ask? Wallace, now Spencer. No. It was Spencer and then Wallace. I, I beg your pardon, Mr. Dr. Spencer, why did you hire Oliver Townsend in the first place? Well, he was highly recommended by one of the greatest architects in the world, the head of the uh, department, State University, Professor uh, Morrissey. Morrissey. Yes. Uh, doctor, are, are you all right? Is something the matter? <laughs> Major Morrissey! <laughs> Lieutenant, you tell General Wallace if he wants my Spencer rifles, he can try to take them himself. How did you, how did you know, Major? How did you know? How did I know that, what? That the rebels would attack the battles on. Now, you're to form your men by the river, close by to the ravine at Dill's Branch. Now, map coordinates 18 and I 36. I know where that and is. And you are to hold there. You, you've got to hold that position no matter what. Major, last night you said they'd attack... How'd you know? Now I can show it to you properly. Because Morrissey's men got the rifles back. You see, these are Spencers. See how they differ from the muskets carried by the other troops? I'm not sure I do. But it's obvious. These aren't muzzle loaders. These are breech loading repeaters. That's why General Wallace tried to take them away. Spencer Wallace Morrissey. Now tell me one more thing. Why Shiloh? Shiloh? Every one of these names appear in your life, your real life, except Shiloh. Shiloh was a church. But what else was Shiloh? It was... It was a biblical town in the land of Ephraim. And there, in a beautiful temple called Shiloh, was where the priests of Eli presided over the holy sanctuary. A temple? Yes, a beautiful temple. One of the first of the temples. It was more than a tabernacle. It was a... a temple. Do you understand? Yes. With walls and doors and pillars. Oh, it was small, but it was magnificent. And it was my first exercise in design when I studied at the university. No one really knows what the Temple of Shallow looked like, but I saw it so clearly... Now you must really think I'm crazy, huh? No. And that's how Professor Morrissey came to notice me. He was bowled over by the beauty of my design. And, and that's how I became his protege. But when I graduated and went to work, I found out something. The temple is always being destroyed. The temple of Shiloh. I don't understand. That you. lovely temple, the Philistines destroyed it. And when I came out into the world, I discovered... That wherever you build a temple, no matter where it is, what it is, the Philistines will always desecrate or destroy it. And that's why you're no longer an architect. I don't want to fight the Philistines any longer. Maybe you didn't fight them long enough. They always win. And is that what you're trying to do now, be killed at Shiloh? I'm not trying to be killed. Yes. As time goes on, the battle becomes more and more real. The Holy Temple... And Morrissey, the keeper and protector. And Spencer, the practical man of building. And Wallace, who takes away initiative. You all come together at Shiloh. 
I don't follow Oh, you. yes, you do. Oliver, listen to me. You can't live in two worlds of fantasy. One must be real. I have a real world. This one... No. More and more, this one becomes an illusion, and the other becomes the reality. That isn't true. Soon you'll be back there. Your life will be back there. I don't have that much of an imagination. It will be real. And the next time you go back to fight the Battle of Shiloh, you'll be dead. Major Morrissey died at Shiloh. How do you know? Because I did what you were always afraid I'd do. I looked up the records. Morrissey's rifles saved the day. But they were wiped out. After Shiloh, they no longer existed. Boys, our orders are to hold here at the river. We will obey those orders. Don't go back there, Oliver. Don't. Fire the way you were trained to fire. Steady. Calmly. Pick your targets. Keep on the cover. Oliver, come back. Wilma. Come back, Oliver. Goodbye, Wilma. No, Oliver, you will be killed. I have to go. The Philistines are attacking Shiloh. You, you said it, Oliver. You said it yourself. The Philistines are always attacking Shiloh. Always attacking, always destroying. Hold tight, boys. Oliver, come back. Goodbye, Wilbur. It's such a beautiful morning. Why do so many battles begin on a beautiful morning? Oliver, you will die. I'm willing to die for Shiloh. Don't die for Shiloh. Live for Shiloh. Live for it here and now. Don't go back a hundred years. Fight for it now. Here. Wilma. Oliver, the Philistines are attacking here and now. Save Shiloh. It can't be saved. Don't quit. Fight for it here. Fight now. Wilma, my men need me. Those men need nothing. They're a hundred years dead. We need you. Oliver, I need you. Come back. Come back. Come back. And build a hundred shallows. And he did. The temple is built so that it will be destroyed, so that it will be rebuilt again. And this is the story that is told and retold over the centuries we have seen. And as it will be retold in the times that are to come. I shall return shortly. The hidden place, the secret place that exists within us all, becomes a world, a second world. And sometimes we feel we can live in both worlds, the one inside and the one outside. But this isn't true, because sooner or later, we must choose. The secret world is Shiloh, and we must always decide whether we shall be the builders or the destroyers of the temple. Our cast included Howard Da Silva, Joan Lovejoy, Robert Dryden, Joan Shea, and Russell Horton. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Do you think I... For two million bucks? Oh, yeah. So would I. You've got it all figured out. Oh, and I should have guessed it from the beginning. Cousin, I was slated to become the corpse to get you the insurance money. That's very clever of you to work it all out. What are you going to do now? Yell for the police? Oh, no, no. Cousin, we're going to go ahead with your plan. But with different results. Oh, you oh, are going to be the dead one. Ben, ben, stop! Stop! I'll kill you! No, no you won't! Oh. 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 Ben! Ben, good Lord! I've killed him! I've killed him! This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams...
The preceding program was broadcast with the permission of the Columbia Broadcasting System.